And it's ta- past time for us to begin this evening, and so everyone can uh, get prepared to join us in our study. And in just a moment, we are going to be inviting James Martin forward to lead our singing, and also Les Clark will have our opening prayer. Uh, before we do that, though, I get to introduce Jared Saltz, who is a friend of our families and is someone who has spoken for us in the past here and been part of not only our in-person Bible classes, but he also participated in a uh, extended dive into the text of Judges and Ruth that we did a couple of years ago. I think it was 2020 at this point. Uh, numbers blend together, and I, I guess I'm more distractible than normal. Um, but we're glad that he's here. We're sad that his entire family could not be with us. Um, his daughter's health has been up and down the last couple of months, and it was in their best interest and her best interest to let her not endure the travel up here. But that is to our loss uh, as much as it is to hers. Um, but we're glad that he's here, and we're glad that we're going to be able to work together tonight in spiritual things. Jared is going to be approaching our study this evening as a Bible class, uh, so be prepared to be called upon or interacting with him in the course of the study. Um, the subject tonight is equipped to teach uh, with a side or second topic of tools to help busy Bible teachers prepare for their classes. And so This is something that he's very passionate about, um, something I think is important for all of us to become more competent and capable at, which is to teach God's word and do so effectively and responsibly. And so this time uh, we're going to ask uh, James to come forward and lead our song. And then after that, Les will have our prayer. And after the prayer, Jared will begin our study. James. If you'd like to mark in your books, the invitation song will be number 853, when we all get to heaven. 853. The first song will be number 47, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Yeah. 
Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for this time that we can come together and study from your holy and divine word. We thank you, Lord, for the material blessings you so greatly bless us with. We know that all these things come from you, and we don't ever want to take them for granted. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us this evening as we go through this study, that you'll be with Jared, that he'll teach your word in a way that'll be plain and simple, that we can understand it in the way you intended for us to, and to be able to have application and apply it to our lives, where it'll be beneficial to us, to build us up, make us stronger, and encourage us to do your will and be a, a good example to all those that are around about us. We pray, Father, that you'll be with those of our number that are having health problems. We pray that you'll bless them with better health, that it be your will, that they can soon be back with us and worshiping with us. Uh, we pray, Father, that you'll go with us through the days of our lives, that the people that we come in contact can see that we live a different life than the world lives, and that we can have opportunities to teach them the good things about you and your son. We're so thankful for the spiritual blessings we have through you and your son and our Savior Jesus. We pray, Father, that we'll uh, always look to you for guidance in everything that we do in our lives. We pray for your grace and for your mercy in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good evening. It's good to see all of y'all again. It's been, I guess, a last year since I, we were up here. I am sorry our uh, family wasn't able to come. I always know that that's about three quarters of the reason the Martins invite us anyway. I was talking to my youngest daughter, um, Abigail, and I said, you know, are you sorry you're not able to go? And she said she was, she was, she was real sad that she wasn't able to leave. Um, and I asked, is it because you're missing Jesse. Um, Jesse lived with us the last month of the school year. He's going to be living with us again this coming year during the school year. And you have to understand something about Abigail. Although she is seven, she is absolutely vicious. And she just looked at me. She goes, no, I don't miss Jesse. I do like James, though. So when we heard that James was going to be invited to come forward, I said, oh, no, what's going to, he going to get in trouble for, for this evening? But instead, it was just a lead singing. So better him than me. What we're going to talk about this evening is a topic that Phil has already introduced, and it's the idea of how do we want to equip ourselves for teaching Bible class. And this is not just something that I think is, is, is beneficial or necessary for people uh, like me or like Phil, Phil who preach full-time. This is for someone, uh, this is for everyone who might someday even teach a single class. And, and that's not just talking about from up here. Uh, I'm talking about from up here. I'm talking about in a kid's class. I'm talking about to your kids. I'm talking about to someone in, a, uh, in someone's home in any sort of a way. Because what we should be as Christians are people who are teachers. We should be people of the book. And that means that we should always be prepared to teach. You know, this is one of these things that makes elders is they are good at teaching. And that doesn't just mean preaching. Sometimes we can buy into this idea, I think incorrectly, that that's just this. And we might think, well, you know, I'm not going to be a preacher. Or you might think, I'm not even going to teach a whole Bible class. Or you might say, well, you know, I'm a woman. I'm not. No, no, no. This is for everybody. Because we are all going to be teachers. And let me just kind of demonstrate why I think this is a useful thing. Uh, we are going to have this more of a Bible class setting, so, so feel free to raise your hand or just shout out answers or stop me midway. But let's start out with a question I always like asking. How many of y'all have studied the book of Acts in a Bible class? Just raise your hands. Okay. Now, let, just keep your hands up for a second. How many of y'all have studied the book of Acts more than once? More than twice? More than three times? More than four times. Anybody six, seven, or eight times? Ten times? Getting close? May, marginal? And Phil, you didn't even grow up in the church. Ten times. Now let me ask you another question. How many of y'all have studied all class on Esther? Not as many hands went up. What about Nahum? What about Chronicles? Leviticus, you notice something about those hands going up? There's a whole lot of the Bible 
that we have not gotten around to very often. And there's a whole lot of a few books that we just keep on going over and over and over. Now, is there anything wrong with studying the book of Acts? No, I love teaching Acts. I teach Acts uh, pretty frequently at the college. I love Acts. It's super cool. But you remember what Paul talks about preaching? The whole counsel of God. That all of it is equally inspired. Now, what I don't think is the case is I don't think that the reason we've all studied Acts 15,000 times, uh, exaggerating a little bit, and some of the others is not once, is because a lot of times someone will come to somebody, and, and you know, maybe the elders have come to you, and they say, you know, look, we, we're gonna, you're going to teach a Bible class next year. And you think about what on earth you feel comfortable in teaching, and you know what you feel comfortable in teaching? The thing that you've heard 15,000 times. So you're going to teach Acts. You know what the only problem with that is? It becomes a self-fulfilling cycle. Because the next time I'm going to come to someone else and say, you know what, I'm going to need you to teach next year. And you know what you're going to teach? Acts, because that's what you've heard. And we're creating these paths, these ruts in some ways, where the only thing that we can teach is the thing that we've heard taught because that's where we feel like we've got some comfort. And we want to teach something. We want to do a good job. And we say, you know what? I feel prepared to teach what I feel equipped to teach the thing I've heard the most. Because we're not exactly sure how to teach something new that maybe we haven't heard a bunch or that we don't already know the questions to ask and that we sometimes as the audience don't already know the questions they're going to ask. Because how often have you seen that? Have you ever been visiting a different congregation and you're visiting class and it's Acts, because it always is, and you know exactly the questions the teacher's going to ask you before it even happens? That there's some comfort in there, there's some familiarity, but what if we're gonna teach something else? What if we wanna be that first person to do something different and by that step, equipping a whole other group of people to do that in the future? Because if you're the first person to teach Esther, well. Now they're going to feel more comfortable doing it in the future. In other words, when we choose what to teach and how to teach and to teach, we're not just equipping us in that one moment. We're actually helping equip everybody in all the places they're going to be in a downstream place that might affect who knows how many people over time. And that's why being equipped to teach is useful. And that's why I think it's good to maybe think about it from a different perspective in terms of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it if we're going to do something new or different that maybe we don't feel as comfortable with. So how would we approach that? Well, we're going to think about this from two different perspectives. There's two different passages that I think about a lot when it talks about teaching. Now, of course, we're going to go to Timothy. That's the one everybody's going to think about. But there's two others that I think may be a little bit less common. The first is in one of these books we don't study that often. It comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, David is wanting to, of course, build the temple. But the problem with David building the temple is what? Yeah, he's he's a murderer. He can't do it. And yet... Does he say, okay, I'm not going to be the person to build the temple. I'm just not going to do anything about it. No. In 1 Chronicles 29, he comes to the people and he says, My son Solomon, verses 1 through 5, God has chosen him alone. Now he's young and inexperienced. And the task is great because the building isn't just built for a human. It's built for the Lord God. So to the best of my ability, I have made provision already for the house of my God. And he goes on, and you know what David's done? He saved up gold because he knows the temple's going to need gold. He saved up silver because he knows the temple's going to need silver. He takes up all these different things. He gives all this work. But we might say, well, David, why'd you do all that work? You're not going to be the one to build the temple. But he's prepared for it in case someone needs something down the line. And the first way that we want to think about preparing to teach is actually using this metaphor of David. And that is well before we ever get told or called in by the elders, the deacons, whoever is in charge, and say, hey, listen, I want you to teach um, a Bible class next semester. What are you going to do it on? We need to be preparing to teach now. Even if we may never teach You know, David didn't wait to find out. He's already making preparations to do these sorts of things. So the one way we want to prepare to teach is actually preparing right now 
for something that's way in the future. And these are things we do as members, not just as preachers or teachers or Bible class. These are, these are things all of us can do. We're going to talk a little bit about this um, today. We're going to spend less time on this, um, more on the next one, but we're going to spend a little bit. And the reason you want to do this is both for yourself and for others. You know, David didn't get to build the temple. But I think all of us know that that process of saving up, of thinking of God first, of dedicating time and resources and attention to preparing to build the temple, that benefits him because it keeps his focus in the right place. It's preparing him even though he never gets to do it. But of course, it also benefits others. Because Israel and Solomon and all these other people get to benefit from that which he has done. And I would suggest the same thing is true of our own preparation to teach. Even if, like David, you never end up teaching a whole Bible class in your entire life. Now, that's a pretty rare, probably, situation. Most of us probably will. But even if you never do, it will benefit you to prepare for it. And it will benefit others. Because... Who of us doesn't like having prepared people coming to Bible class? And if you are preparing to teach, you are going to be prepared to learn. And you are going to be prepared in a lot of ways. We're going to talk about some specific ways to do this. But more often, maybe, when we think about teaching and being prepared to teach a Bible class, we might think about being prepared like Ezra. And you remember Ezra. We we read about him, finding him in in Ezra chapter 7. You know, Ezra was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king had granted him everything he requested because the hand of the Lord God was on him. But we read there in verse um, 10, 9 and 10, that Ezra had determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, to obey it, and to teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. Now, Ezra had already prepared like David. And because of that preparation, when the king tapped him and said, hey, I need you to go to Israel, to Judea. I need you to go from your position here in Persia. I need you to go to Judea and teach people. Well, he's ready to go. That doesn't mean he doesn't do specific preparation for that specific task. But he's already built a foundation And he's able to use that foundation to go in and do this thing. So this is when your elders come to you and say, hey, listen, um, next semester, next trimester, whatever schedule you do, even if it's a fill-in or something else, you're going to be teaching X, Y, or Z class. Well, now you will have already a foundation that's going to make that easier to do. Now we're going to get to that passage that we all think about teaching. And that comes from Paul's charge to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. This is the passage I think we all probably think about with teaching. And it's when he comes to Timothy, or he writes to Timothy, and he says, Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for believers in speech and conduct in love and faith and in purity. And until I come... Give your attention to public reading, to exhortation, and to teaching. And don't neglect the gift that's in you. It was given to you through prophecy, with the laying on of hands, by the counsel of elders, and practice these things, and be committed to them, so that your progress may be evident towards all. And pay close attention to your life, and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for in doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers, both yourself and your hearers. Sometimes we often think probably more about this as, as preaching, but it's true of teaching as well. We can get discouraged thinking, oh, you know, I just haven't baptized anybody lately. No one's really being saved by my lessons. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says when we're being faithful and studying and teaching, we're always saving somebody. Yourself and your hearers. By being faithful in our preparation to teach, we're saving ourselves. We're doing what's right. And that's always going to make it beneficial. We're going to come back to this at the end of class to think about, but this is important. And this is something we've all got to do. We're all going to be dedicated to this in these ways. But you might say, well, okay, that's great, but how? You know, most of us realize, I think, probably, that teaching's important. You know, that's, that's why we, we want good teachers. That's why we want to do these. But there's a difference between saying something's important and telling someone, okay, now go do it. You know, I like living in a house with air conditioning. We found, you know, I know some of y'all probably have that on your minds recently. 
Um, but if you came to me and said, okay, Jared, I need you to go build an air conditioning unit, I'd be like, we should do a good job with this. And that's about where I'd have to stop. You know, knowing to do something well is different than knowing how to do it. Now, let's, 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 let's be uh, uh, real here. We're not going to teach every single little building of an air conditioning in one class. But what I want to do, and what I hopefully, and I think we can do, is give ourselves some broad strokes that will benefit us all so we can all have a starting point. We can all at least have a, for lack of a better uh, term, sort of a, a checklist, an instruction manual, to have some place to start and go so we do have some ways to think about teaching. So let's think about this first one first. Let's think about that David style of preparing to teach, this way ahead of time, these preparing for a day that may or may not come sort of a situation. This is one that I think actually is going to be immediately relevant to every single one of you. You know, this is the one that you don't know if your elders are going to ask you to teach in the future. You just know that you're supposed to be being equipped to start teaching. So what would I say if he, you know, said, okay, you know, I, I want to be able to eventually at some time in the future be prepared to teach. What should I be doing now to helping myself prepare? Let's think about a few things. The first thing that I would suggest, and this may sound a little funny, is start taking notes in a way that will be beneficial to you not just now, but in the future. And, you know, for a long time, uh, uh, maybe hedge that a little bit, but for a while, because I, I wasn't converted until I was, I was pretty far along, I wasn't in childhood, and that's when a lot of times I feel like people tell their kids, oh, take notes. Did y'all get told take notes in class growing up? Okay. And so you take notes, and um, how long did those like, notes last you? Do you still have those notes, James? No? Miriam, you still got your notes? You, of course you do. Um, any of you all take notes when you are growing up? Uh huh. Do you still have them? Maybe some of them? You know, the problem with me taking notes on paper where I think, is they got shoved down in my backpack and rolled up and crumpled up and tossed. And even if I have them, I can't find anything in them. So you need notes that are going to be beneficial. The reason this is nice is because this way when you get called upon to teach, you know what's really nice to have is you're like, you know what? I was sitting in Phil's class on this, and I've got my notes for that. That's a pretty good place to start. You're not starting from nothing. Starting from nothing is much harder than starting from something. So taking notes in a way that can benefit yourself, benefit others in the future, and finding a way to do that. Maybe it's on paper. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't love paper, but... You know, everybody does their own thing. You know, Phil sticks all of his in Lagos. Um, some people, they have these little bitty, um, little Bible books. They're a single book. And on one page, they've got your biblical text. And the next page, on every page, it's a whole blank page. And I know some people say, okay, we're studying Romans. I'm going to buy this for $3. And all of my Romans notes are just going to go in there. And now it's kind of set together. But whatever it is for you, find a thing that you can have some notes, take notes, practice taking notes. And this isn't just something for children. This can be something that's good for all of us to be thinking through things. So maybe take notes in a way that you can find them and use them later. That's a, a good place to start. Uh, another one is start practicing the things that you would need to be able to be good at if you got called upon to teach a Bible class. This, this, this I think should make sense. Which is generally, you know, when you get sent to a new job, you get some training. You know, you don't just get thrown out in there. Now, some of us, maybe we learn to swim by getting thrown out in there, and some of that works. But the problem with that sink or swim method is sometimes what happens? You sink. Have any of y'all ever been in a Bible class where someone clearly got thrown into the sink or swim method, and you're like, someone needs to save that man. He is drowning and taking us with him. Right? We've probably all been in one of those. Hopefully that wasn't you. Um, you know, that's, that's real bad. You know, you're up front, you're drowning, and you know you are, and you just don't know how to swim. And you're just like, I'm sorry y'all are coming down with me. So maybe having some practice in some of the things that you're going to do ahead of time would be useful. You know, in a low stakes sort of a situation. Now taking notes is part of that. But another thing that maybe we don't think about is when we're preparing to go to Bible class, are we actually preparing not just to go, but what if you prepared even though you're just going as if you were going to teach? We're preparing our hearts to yeah. accept and learn. Just like David, preparing, he may not get to do that thing. But, you know, it's hard enough sometimes, I feel like, to have people just even read the Bible beforehand. 
But what if you really prepared? You don't think that's going to benefit you and benefit others if you're really prepared, not just to learn, but thinking about it in terms of teaching? That before you show up to Bible class, you know, not something like this, but like an actual Bible class where you know to read, you know, Acts you know, six, seven, whatever it is, you know, that you're like, you know, okay, I've gone through this. I've thought out the questions that I think are the most important questions. I've thought about what this is saying. And if I had to explain to someone what this text is about, I could do that. That's a really good skill to practice. And that's a skill that's going to benefit you whether you teach ever or not. So maybe think about practicing some of those skills beforehand. Uh, Another thing that I think sometimes we don't, we don't think about, but I think can be a very good thing to do if you have time is find something good that you can read along while you're taking the Bible class. You know, maybe you're studying, I don't know, what are y'all studying on y'all's? Guess what? Is it Acts? <laughs> yes! I, I love it when a plan comes together. You know, so you're studying the book of Acts, or you're studying the book of Luke, or you're studying something else. Phil, how many times, is this your first time teaching Acts here? Okay, there we go. If it was like your second or third time, I was going to just mercilessly make fun of you. That'd be fair. That'd be fair. Y'all get on him, okay? If he comes back around and asks you, like, look, we ain't taught this book before yet. Um, <laughs> finding something and maybe asking whoever's teaching, you say, hey, if I wanted to just have something myself to read to help prepare myself to think about it a little bit deeper, deeper, to get a different perspective, what would I do? Find something short. Find something readable. A lot of times, if you get something good, it's very enjoyable, it's very beneficial, and you're practicing this skill that's really going to benefit you if you ever get called to teach. Because otherwise, you can get really kind of stuck. I I remember the first time I was going to help teach a a Bible class, and um, I don't know which was worse. The first time, I was teaching a teen class, and they didn't give me anything. They are just like, go. And I was thinking... I don't know anything. I don't think go is a good starting point for any of this, right? And, you know, now we're back to the air conditioning situation. You just build an air conditioning. You're like, well, I know what it's supposed to do, but I don't know how to get there. Or the the other time situation when I started my first preacher internship thing um, is they just, like, shoveled a bunch of stuff on me that I had to read, and I'd never read any of this stuff before and I was like what am I supposed to do with this that's like the the air conditioning metaphor they gave me all the tools but I got no clue what the difference is between a screwdriver and a hammer and a hacksaw and anything else it's like well great but what am I going to do you know it'd be easier is if we started practicing some of these skills ahead of time you know so take notes being prepared reading one thing that's easy and good can help you in lots of ways and so that if you ever get called to teach a big bible class all of a sudden you're not you're not thrown for a loop. You're like, yeah, I've done this before. You know, maybe not in the same way, but I, I, at least I know how to swim a little bit. You know, I'm not like just getting thrown in one all the time. And so doing this is, is good. These all things prepare foundations. And once you've kind of got that a little bit, I think the next good step to do is, what if you actually started preparing a Bible class for yourself? You know, maybe you pick a topic, maybe you pick a book, maybe it's Acts, Right? You know, maybe it's something else. And it's not like the elders have come to you and say, hey, you know, I need you to teach this book, so and so and so and so. You're just saying, I'm going to practice by doing this. I'm going to, on my own, start building out a Bible class and taking notes and putting stuff together as if I was going to teach. You know, pick something small. You know, maybe not Philemon, short, but, you know, maybe it is Philemon. You know, maybe you're picking something that you could fill in for somebody with. You know, that's always a good thing. You know, how many times have, you know, a preacher's out of town or one of y'all have had to fill in? You know, what if, you know, it wasn't Wednesday night or, you know, someone gets sick and you don't have to just pull something out of the ground. You've got one ready. You've prepared maybe a psalm, maybe a short book like Jonah or like uh, Philemon or First John or whatever else. And you're ready to go because you've already prepared it. And even if you never teach that, You think studying a book well enough to teach it's not going to benefit you? Not going to benefit everybody around you? And you're already ready to go in case you get called upon. You're ready to go like David was who prepared things ahead of time even though he knew he wasn't going to be the one who was going to build the temple. That is something that will benefit us. And that's something every single one of y'all, every single one of us, include myself in this, can benefit from. And that's a really easy way to start out to being prepared to be equipped to teach. 
is be ready. Be ready to step in if you're needed. And even if you're not, even if you never get called, still benefit it in that way. That's a, that's a good step. I, try that sometime, and I guarantee it's going to make Bible class more beneficial for you, even if you're not the one who's teaching it. It's always, always helpful. But probably the one that we're going to talk about more, and maybe the one that we're thinking about more, is like, okay, that's great. I'll start now. But you know, I don't have time to start doing this broad thing right now because, you know, I'm going to teach next trimester. You know, or I'm preaching next Sunday. Or I, what do we do when we now have a timeline? You know, when we're thinking about that more Ezra. Ezra has spent his whole life preparing, but there's a difference between that preparation kicking up another notch when he's sent from Persia to Judea. Now he's got a specific task. He's got a specific requirement, a specific way to go about things. You say, okay, I'm going to teach, you know, whatever it is that I'm going to teach next. How many of y'all teaching next trimester? Y'all use trimesters or semesters? What, what arrangement do y'all use for about classes? Quarters. Quarters. Y'all are just, just special. So who's teaching next quarter? You are. I hope you know how to do some of this by now. Uh, y'all are in trouble. Anybody else teaching next quarter? You're the only one to teach next quarter? We both start Okay. Well, maybe the next quarter after that? You're like, oh, no. That could be, it could be you, right? So let's think about a plan if we're going to teach. Maybe it's next quarter. Maybe it's in two quarters. How, often, how far out do you all plan y'all's Bible class teaching? Y'all are thinking about it now. A quarter out. A quarter out. Okay. Give people some, some time to get ready. Okay. So let's pretend then every single one of you got word tonight that next quarter, you're teaching. You're like, oh no, what do I got to do? So let's think of a plan. And this is a pretty, uh, pretty basic plan. We're not going to, again, give all the ins and outs of everything. And let me be really clear, this is not the only plan that could work. This is just one way to do this. All right. And everybody's going to be a little bit different. And as you do it more, you're going to figure out your own way that works. Just like any job, there's a way that you get taught, and then there's a way you end up doing it that works better for you. Um, and then, of course, there's some people who they get taught one way and then they're doing a way that works better for them. It's everybody else is thinking that's not really working. Um, hopefully we can have some accurate self-image there. But if we're going to build a temple, if we're going to build a building, what's the first thing you need to do? What does David do before anybody starts laying out the plan? Starts Counting costs, right? Gathering up materials, getting all this stuff together, right? It says he lays up gold and silver and all these precious jewels, counting the costs, knowing what to do. You know, that's a pretty good start for teaching a Bible class as well. It's, it's step one, we might say, is then to, to gather your materials together. Get, get your stuff together. Because y'all know the story of the three little pigs? His favorite story, my, my nephew is down here, and he's, he loves that story. We have lots of different Three Little Pigs books. We have, you know, the Three Little Pigs and the Bit of Bag Wolf. We have the Big Bad Pig and the Three Little Wolves, all different versions of this. But you remember what happens to the one he wants to get done quick. He just gathers up a bunch of what? Straw. Now, if we turn that into a Bible story, what happens to the wise man who builds his house on the sand? Yeah, it goes splat. We all know the, the kid's song. We want to make sure that we have good materials because I don't care how good of a Bible class teacher you are or how good of an architect you are, if you're given trash, you're going to build trash. What do we tell our kids? Garbage in, garbage out in terms of what they, you know, that's the same thing of our stuff too. If you have good materials, it's a whole lot better, easier to, to, to do good. You know, um, I, this is true in every aspect of life. If you're given good stuff to work with, a whole lot easier doesn't mean you're guaranteed to do all right. Some people can just mess up something no matter what. Uh, me doing, I don't know, anything with cars, okay? But uh, we all have these things, so let's gather good materials. We say, okay, well, what, what are we going to do? Well, the first step is to get good recommendations. Get good recommendations. Talk to someone who knows. You know, maybe um, you're going to teach, uh, we'll pick Habakkuk. And you're like, I ain't never taught Habakkuk. I've never heard a class on Habakkuk. I barely, I don't know how to spell Habakkuk. Is that two Ks, one K, three Ks? I don't know. What you do is you go to someone who has studied it before and preferably who's taught it before. And you say, hey, you know, James, I know that you're the world leading expert on Habakkuk. Um, what have you read that was good? Well, you're probably going to get some good recommendations. You know, not just everybody's going to know off the top of their head something that's good for something, but find someone who has some expertise in that area. You know, I'm, if I'm going to, you know, fix a plumbing issue, I'm probably going to go to someone who knows something about plumbing. I'm not going to expect, well, you know, Bob over there is real good at um, 
architecture. I'm going to ask him about plumbing. Well, that's not the same thing. Find someone who has some expertise in that. You know, find someone who's taught that. Say, hey, what, what would you recommend? It's a good way to start. This way you're not wasting your time reading stuff that's bad or reading stuff that's not good or gathering bad materials. Now, if you can't find anybody, there's a few other resources. One thing um, some, some brethren put together, it's called the Commended Commentary List. It's not super up to date, but it's probably, if you pick their best picks, you're not going to get something bad. It may not be the best thing, but it's probably good enough for government work. Uh, another one, if you will, you know, you're like, oh, I can't remember what that's called. If you literally type in bestcommentaries.com, there's a list for all the different books. It's pretty good. It's not great, but it's pretty good. It's better than nothing. It's better than just, you know, closing your eyes, throwing a dart, and be like, that's what I'm going to read. Because uh, that's what we want to avoid. We want to get good materials. Uh, so we can ask that. Well, the second thing we want to do as part of this gathering of materials is figure out how much time you've got. You know, this is part of that counting that cost business. You know, if you think, oh, I'm going to read all these 15 different things, and you're like, well, you got two hours, good luck. And by good luck, we all know what that means. It's not going to work out so well. So plan. So you know what? I can dedicate this many hours, this much time. I can read one thing. I can read two things. I can read three things. Figure out what it is. Time is a finite resource. Spend it wisely and use that to plan what you're going to do. And, and, and lastly, if you do have time, then read things that are a little bit different. You know, one of the benefits of reading is that it's someone who can sometimes disagree with you so that you can realize if you disagree with them. Uh, what I mean by that is you will never know if you're wrong if everybody always agrees with you. You'll never know you're wrong. Most of the time we don't think, hey, I think about this and everybody agrees with me. I better make sure I'm right. No, it's normally when someone challenges us and say, hey, are you right about that? You say, well, let me go back and check. Let me consider it. So reading some things that are a little bit different can help us think, oh, I don't know about that, and you'll think about them a little bit more. You know, you don't always want to agree on read something that, or talk with somebody who always agrees with you on everything. Because how does Proverbs talk about sharpening something? As butter sharpens iron? As, you know, something cotton sharpens iron? As cardboard sharpens a knife? What happens if you run a knife through cardboard a whole bunch of times? It dulls it. Why? It's soft, it's easy, you knife cut through that cardboard just fine. But it's nothing that's going to challenge it. It's nothing that can actually sharpen as iron sharpens iron. So finding some other things that sometimes can push back on you, even if you don't agree with them, can be beneficial to you. Because you're not trying to swallow anything whole. Just like you don't want to listen to one preacher and just like, well, take my word for it, never look at the Bible. We don't want to do that with our reading either. We want to find people that are beneficial, who know what they're talking about, and, get, and create good materials from that. So put together maybe one thing, maybe two things, maybe three things. Something that's manageable, depending on what your time got. Read something that's good, and all of a sudden you're going to have a whole lot of good materials, and that's going to make it a lot easier to build something good. Start with good stuff. You know, that... that that, that's the way to go. You know, any of y'all ever redone y'all's house or anything else, you always go and buy like, let me just pick randomly uh, the flooring we're going to put on our house. You know, let me just pick out a two by four and not check if it's straight. You know, maybe you buy a new RV or something without checking if the, the, the computer in it works or something. But you know how these things go. Pick stuff that's good and the product is more likely to be good. Sound like a good first step? Good materials? Now, that in some ways is the easy part. So now we gotta put something together. We gotta make a plan. And we gotta, we gotta count the cost from the beginning to the end. We gotta make sure that we have something that's gonna work because a pile of good lumber ain't a house. And it just the, the materials isn't what we're going for. We gotta turn that into something and that requires a plan. So let, let's think about this. Let's think about it in the broadest way. The first thing you wanna know is how much time am I gonna have to do what I wanna do? Well. If you're teaching by quarters, then you don't want to plan to have enough classes that would fill out a semester or a trimester or a year. That's, that's not the way to go. Otherwise, you're like, well, we got through two chapters of Acts. I guess we're done. Right? Uh, figure out how much time you got and use that effectively. The second part is when you've did that, figure out what you're going to talk about for each of your classes. Maybe it's a chapter a day. Sometimes that works out. A lot of times it doesn't. Maybe instead you say, okay, we're going to spend these three chapters on this and these three chapters on that. We're going to spend up here. Or maybe you spend a little bit different. Y'all are going to get to the end of the book of Acts. Where are y'all in Acts? Just started. Just started, okay. 
Well, my humble suggestion is if you're starting and you're spending a chapter, by the time you get to the end with that last sea journey business, you're not going to want to spend the same amount of time there as you're necessarily going to spend in all the other chapters. You don't have to arrange it by number. You can figure out a different way to arrange it. Maybe it's by a schedule or a structure or what you think is important or what questions we're going to ask. Figure that out. And then you take your notes and you take the ideas that you're going to put together and you say, you know what, now you actually got to turn this into something that looks like a Bible class. Because we've all been in classes, or hopefully you haven't, but unfortunately I think you probably have, where someone gets up and they just pick, you know, they picked up in the middle of a chapter or the middle of a verse because that's where they landed last time and you just kind of go until you run out of time and you're like, there wasn't really a plan here. I think what works best, and we know this with sermons, but I think it's true of classes as well, is when you say, you know what, I'm going to get through this material for this class because I want to accomplish this thing. Every class period, you as a teacher should have a goal. Not just of stuff to cover, but of something to accomplish. And then you've structured everything around that. Where you've spent your time, the questions you ask, how you've covered things, is all leading into this thing that you've put together. You know, for me here, it's pretty easy because it's a topical class. The whole thing is by the end of this, I want you to be able to say, you know what, it may be a lot of work, but you know, I, I feel like I could probably put something together. I know where to start. I know the right questions to ask. I feel like I have a plan I could do. But that should be the case with our Acts classes and our Second Peter classes and our Third John classes, is when you as the teacher say, hey, what do I want them to get out of this? And then you're not just providing a list of random comments or random definitions. The literal meaning of this Greek word is this. You're teaching something. Now you might say, wow, that sounds hard. And it is harder. It is harder. But if you think about that while you're taking your notes and as you're putting your classes together and as you're figuring out how you're going to talk about all that, all of a sudden it becomes much, much easier. Just asking that question is going to give you some unity that you might not otherwise have. And that's going to help all of your other aspects too. You might say, hey, what's my application going to be? Well, ask, what do you want them to get at? When you read this section of the Bible, what do you want them to get out of it? Well, there's your application. And you don't have to be stretching for an application or wondering what it's going to do because you've, you've planned this out. And you've known it from the beginning. You know, God doesn't just be like, oh man, I made humans and I, oh, they sinned. I, what am I going to do now? No, remember he says before the foundations of the world, he had planned and purposed to send Jesus' his son. You know, God's not just flying by the seat of his pants. And, and if it's not necessary, we probably shouldn't when it comes to Bible classes either. I did um, read, and I hope this is a preacher story that's not true, but I, I've heard someone who, who tells me that this is true, that they had a preacher when they were growing up who he would just ask questions in the audience about what he should preach about that day, and he would just pick the one he liked the most and go. And I think, oh, my, that's... I don't feel like that's the winning proposition for how this should work out. But we say, okay, we've got our materials. We put together what we're going to cover each class. We figured out when we've, when we've, what we're going to really do with each class. And we figured out the way we want to talk about it. We figured out our strategy. You know, this is a big part too. If you're going in, if you're doing sales or if you're making a pitch to someone, you sort of have a way that conversation is going to go. Maybe not every single word. Maybe you write a manuscript like me and have a sermon. But if you've got Bible class, you're going to have questions. It's not going to be as tight. But you have a strategy. Where are you going to take them from here to here to here? What now? Well, then the rubber meets the road. Now we've got to go live in this house that we've built in. Now you get the hard part. Actually teaching it. Is this the part that bothers anybody? You're like, you know, I feel like we're really good to prepare. But then I get in front of people and I just like... You know, that's the part that worries me. Well, what do we do with this? What makes a good class? Well, you know, if it's a Bible class that everybody's kind of studied the same thing, it makes it easier. But generally what people want to do is they want to have a good discussion. They want to get people to ask good questions. They want to have good information. But as the teacher, they're really worried about something. They're worried about you guys. Y'all are scary. 
I don't know if y'all know this, and you probably don't feel like it when you're in the audience, but if you get up front, you're like, oh man, those, those people are terrifying. You know, Hallie just scares the socks off of me. Um, but, well, first thing is think about those people that you've had in your life that were good teachers, and think about what made them so. Maybe this is in school. Maybe it's when you know, I was in elementary school. My history teacher, Mr. whatever his name was, you know, he was really good at making me connect the dots. Or maybe you think, you know, that preacher I had 15, 20 years ago, he, I really enjoyed how he did this, this, or this. Or maybe it's, you know, this person does this really, really well. Ask yourself, what did they do that made that stick with you? Think about that, actually. You don't just be like, oh, they're good or they're bad. Think about why. What, 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 what made that work? And then ask, can I copy any of those things? Can I use any of those elements? Can I incorporate any of those techniques? Which ones work for me? Notice, you, you can't just copy someone straight away, because if you're not that person, it's not going to work. Uh, we've all seen those people who end up being come across as fake when they're trying to copy someone entirely, but you're trying to figure out how to incorporate it in yourself. So think about teaching in that way. Uh, another thing you want to do is you want to sort of avoid some things that make bad teaching. You know, we've all probably had a teacher in school who was just, everything they focused on was pedantry. It was just unimportant stuff. Like, when you went through this Bible passage, how many words the did you see? Like, I'm sorry, I don't think that's, like, the best usage of our time. You ever have a teacher that gave you busy work? That's, that's not what we want to do. We want to avoid busy work. We want to, we want to ask good questions. If we're going to tell them to spend time, we want to make it worth their while. So figure out how to do that. You know, let's avoid pretending we're the expert, you know? Well, I studied this for about 12 more minutes than you did, so I am the expert. Or let me pretend this thing I learned two seconds ago I have always known. Or the literal Greek word, and then, like, you looked at theirs. Let's not pretend we're more than who we are. What we all are is students of God's Word. And this leads into the last thing. The thing that I think a lot of people are scared about is saying, well, what if I ask a question? They ask a question that I don't know the answer to. Is that anything that worries people when they're teaching class? It's what a lot of worries a lot of people. And this is problematic on both ends. First of all, because we've read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, always be prepared to know the answer to those who ask for the hope that's within you. And they say, well, then we must know every answer to every question. It's like, no, that's not what he's talking about. That's about saying, hey, if I was going to ask you why you're a Christian, could you tell me something about it? But... If we feel that way, two things are going to happen. Either we're going to make something up or we're going to create a culture that dissuades people from asking hard questions. You ever had this happen? Someone ask a hard question and like the whole room just like, and like stare at them like, how dare you ask that hard question? Because we're almost like trying to gatekeep hard questions or good questions or questions that might actually encounter people's faith. And we think, oh, well, you can't do that. You better not ask that. You know, they're a bad Christian for asking that question. Well, is that the kind of attitudes we want to foster in here? In the church, where it should be safe for people to bring good questions? You know, ask hard, hard, hard questions of God, David, in the Psalms. Or Elijah at Mount Sinai? Or Jesus? This should be a place where we can ask all these questions and hopefully get better answers. So if you get asked a question you don't know, here's a really great thing to say. I don't know. That's a great question. I've not thought about that before. Let me get back with you next week. Or let's study it. Or, hey, Phil, you know the answer to this one? That's always a great thing. You can always blame the preacher for anything. You're like, oh, I'll turn that over to him. But don't be scared of being asked hard questions, and don't be scared of asking hard questions. So last thing, and then we'll give you all guys some, some time for, for questions yourselves, is we know, hey, the days are evil, and our time is limited, and if I had unlimited time, this is probably how a lot of y'all feel, you know, if I had all the time in the world, I could be a pretty good Bible class teacher. Just give me about 60 hours a week to work on a single Bible class, and I could be great. How many of y'all got 60 hours a week to work on a single Bible class? You got nothing else going on? Well, nobody does, right? Now, every week your time's going to be a little bit different. But here's a single suggestion of how you might want to think about divvying up your time, depending on how much time you got. 
The first thing is, before you even sit down to, to do that thing, that planning stage and figure out, hey, how much time, you know, do I have a trimester, do I have a quarter, do I have two weeks, do I have a single week, how much time, what am I going to do? What am I aiming to accomplish? Right up front, do that counting the cost business. Sink some time in early and say, here's what I really want to do. Have an idea. Now you get a plan, right? You're not just building as you go, hoping it sticks together. You, you've counted the cost. You've checked out your resources. You've got a pretty good idea of what to do. Spending time up front, it may feel bad at the first part, but it's kind of like when you're an undergrad and you've got to write a paper. You always know you're supposed to outline it first, but you're like, I, this is due in 16 minutes. I'm just going. Uh, sometimes preparing for Bible class can feel like that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just ask Jesse. Um, but you got this going on here. Well, do some planning up front. Then spend about a third of your time reading. Spend about a third of whatever time you got that week or that time just getting good material. It's going to make the rest of your life easier. Then turn that into a note or a script or an idea. Turn about the rest of your half the time taking those notes, putting things together, figuring out what you to do. And you notice what I've not talked very much at all because I think it's the least important thing. Then you can do your visuals. Don't spend all your time on your PowerPoint. You could do it without a PowerPoint. Sometimes we're worried about that PowerPoint too much. No, I, I'm colorblind, so I just, just go with whatever they do. Some people care a lot more about that. You look, you can, if you want to learn about how to do PowerPoint design, talk to somebody else. I don't know. I've got a clue. But do that last. But this is where I think maybe it's good to think about your time. And that comes because of what Timothy says again. What Paul says to Timothy is that teaching is something that is really important. And teaching is something that, let's see if I can do this thing right. There's apparently a highlighter. Here we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. This is fancy. Because when we're doing these things in our teaching, we save both yourself and your hearers. That's us. Good teaching benefits us, the teacher and the hearer. So we got a few minutes for questions. I was told by Jill emphatically, don't wait don't give them too much time for questions because I'm not going to ask all those questions. So I'm hoping Jill's got a good one since she was complaining about that. Jill, you got a good question to start us out with? I didn't mm. promise me. You didn't promise. I was hoping I'd get you for questions. Okay, so what, what, what's, what questions? I know we went pretty quick. There's never enough time to cover everything. But any specific questions you've got, uh, whether about nitpicky things or broader things or, or anything else in terms of preparing a Bible class? Yeah. What, when you're right, my, one of my biggest fears is that question I'm going to get asked. And sure enough, Sunday, I'm seven, eight minutes from finishing, and, and there's that question. And I'm like, there it is. And, and, and I didn't think I was going to get the question like that, but it was. And yes, I'm, it's always dreadful. And afterwards, I'm like, why didn't I just leave it? I don't know. Because that's a perfectly good answer. Perfectly good answer. Uh, here's, a, here's a secret, too, that's pretty good. Sometimes we like want to try to work through it in real time, and sometimes that's okay. Most of the time that just ends up derailing the rest of your class, and you don't accomplish what you're trying to do. I'm a really big fan of just saying, you know what? I do not know, and anything I could say right now probably wouldn't be super beneficial. We'll come back to that next week when I've had some time to think about it. And then you are back on track. But it, you know, we just feel like, and I imagine you as an elder, you really feel like, I'm supposed to have all the answers to this. Well, take some pressure off. The thing about that question was, I lived through it. <laughs> it was actually okay. Yeah. And you made it. You made it. I think one thing uh, that tells me all the time is there's some, it's okay for us not to have the answers. You know, remember uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, he's reading Isaiah. Any of you have to teach Isaiah? And Philip shows, sidles up to him. He's like, you understand what you're reading? And the guy's like... It's Isaiah. How can I understand unless someone explains it to me? You know, or Peter. You know, Peter says, you know, reading Paul, he's like, some things Paul says are hard. So if Peter thinks some things Paul says are hard, we're okay. Yeah. Um, just kind of as far as answering difficult questions, the, in the congregation of people, the older men and women are supposed to teach the younger men and women. What do you think about, as a Bible class teacher, asking other members in the audience if... Phil, what do you think about this question? Yeah, that is, that's really good in a few different ways. Um, first of all, it's nice because, hey, you're not the elder. That's, that's someone else's job. And if you can fob off responsibility, I am a big fit, 
fan of that. I tell people where I preach, I was like, look, I'm just the preacher. I'm not the elder. And I want to make that real clear that everybody remembers that pretty continually. But it's also good because you say, look, I, I don't know. Um, you got something to add or should we just study this more together? And that, that process of actually not knowing everything, that's actually a really good thing for us to think about, um, that we don't know everything. And that's okay. You know, it turns out humility is a Christian virtue. Um, but demonstrating that, because so often, especially preachers, are like they're supposed to have the answer to everything. It's like, no, they're human. And that means there's some things they're pretty dumb about and hopefully they can get better. But yeah, it's a really good point. You know, say, hey, you know, you guys, uh, what, what do y'all have to add to that question? You got anything, you'd say it a little bit differently. Really good point. Other questions? Does that make sense as a strategy? You know, think about materials, get some good stuff to do it, work through it, practice all this before you really need to do it, and then think about what you want to accomplish. Because, you know, we can make teaching really complicated, and I do think to do it well is not the easiest thing always. But at its heart, this is all something we've thought about doing in some ways. And I think in a good way, we think, oh, the Bible's so important. I need to do it differently than I do anything in the rest of my life. And I get where that's coming from, but God gave the Bible in the language that people spoke at that time. And our approach to the Bible shouldn't be so different than what we already know. We shouldn't let its holiness scare us in a bad way, um, if that makes sense. We should always be seeking to learn and practice. And sometimes that means we're going to mess up, and that's okay. Um, that's why we want to just keep on, keep on doing these things, keep on moving forward, and hopefully get better as we go. Any other questions? Phil, you got any questions? I have a lot of questions. A lot of questions, okay. I'll add this. Uh, one thing that's really useful is to share the load. So you can share the load by team teaching. You can share the load by working with a close Christian friend and say, hey, I'm going to be teaching this class. I know you've taught this class before. Let's share our notes together. And I want you to look at what I'm writing for this class. And you can help me make some corrections. Uh, the second thing is to be correctable. You're going to say some things that are wrong. And it's absolutely fine to have someone in the class, after the class, come to you and say, hey, did you notice that you said this, but it reads this way? And the answer is, no, I didn't notice. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, being correctable is probably the strongest skill that you can build if you want to get better at anything, especially teaching. Uh, and I have this little quip um, that I think is important for all of us. Martin Luther wrote two commentaries on a particular Bible book, um, Zechariah. Zechariah in particular. Uh, the first one in Latin, the second one in German, not really necessary for us to know that detail, but it is important to note this. In the first one, it ends abruptly at chapter 13. In the second one, it contains a little bit of information in chapter 14, and then it finishes up with this statement. Here in this chapter, I give up, for I am not sure what the prophet is talking about. Uh, and you're talking about one of the most prolific and well-prepared thinker of his generation going to one of the, the books of the Bible and saying, I got nothing. So it's perfectly okay for you to come to any kind of question and say, I have nothing to add or to explain, and let it be like that, and that's okay. Now, I know for some of us, myself included, that's difficult to, to maintain. So I think it's important for all of us to be okay with a certain level of ignorance. That's, that's how we grow. We grow through that process. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and Phil's just demonstrated a few really good things. First of all, good materials. That came from, I think, David McClister, um, that example. So gathering of good materials right there. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And, and having just had to teach through Zechariah, um, I, I empathize deeply with, with Martin Luther's statement there about the end of the... Any of y'all tried to have to teach the end of Zechariah? Oh, boy. Um, yeah. And, and I have also been on that end of needing to be correct. I remember one class I was teaching. I just got kings mixed up. Just, just talking about one king, and I met the other one. I was just flat out wrong about it. And I was like, no, you're right. I'm just an idiot. Um, and I was like, you know, I should know. I've been doing this a long time. But sometimes you just make stupid mistakes. And that's not like, oh, you're a terrible person. You're, 
damned to hell eternally. It just means you made a mistake and you fix it. You say, you're right. I was wrong. I don't know what I was thinking. And most of us are like, yeah, we've done that before. And, and, and so that shouldn't scare us. We shouldn't dig in our heels. We should be correctable. We should be humble because um, we don't want to be the opposite on that. So that's a really, really good point, our list of points. Um, I'm not sure if there was a question in there or not, but more of a comment. But uh, it's a, it was a good comment nonetheless. All right, we got one more. One more, one more question. It's from someone who's not asked one yet. Yeah. Not really a question, but just a, a, another comment. <laughs> uh, I was like early 20s, and I'm working at a company, and I'm studying with a lot of people, and they're asking me these questions like, where did you learn this? Where did you study this? And looking back on that, really, there were four women from – when I was very young to about age 15, that did an amazing job at teaching me. And I never told them anything, you know, because I didn't realize when I was eight what, what love and dedication they were showing. And those people need to know they're appreciated. A very Timothy-like situation. I think that's true of a lot of us. Um, you know, sometimes we won't know even the influence that our teaching has on others for a long, long, long time, um, but it is, it is beneficial. Well, I appreciate that. I hope that that has been helpful um, for y'all. I hope that that's given you some, uh, some ways to think about it, to approach what's going on. I've, I've messed up the statement here, clicking the wrong button. I'll leave it out there for someone else to fix. Typical, you know, guest preacher comes in, messes everything up, and leaves it to someone else. Um, but I th we have... Something and then the imitation in the song, or was there not something first? Okay, so we, okay, just making sure I'd gotten the schedule right. What I wanted to go back to, the last just minute to think about, is to again look at that Timothy passage. When it talks about how important our teaching is and how important things are for what we do. That our teaching, though, is not a, in a vacuum. That our teaching is not just knowing stuff. Because you notice that's not the only place that Paul tells Timothy to focus on. He says, hey, you know what your teaching is going to be requiring? You need to be setting an example for others in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. The reason we study the Bible is not just to have information. Now, the Bible's really cool. I love studying. I think it is just neat. But there's a whole lot of things that I think are neat. And that they're not about salvation. But our teaching and our study should never be an end to itself. It should be about making ourselves better examples of who Jesus is. The reason we study God's word is to be more like the one who gave it to us. And that what our teaching should do is not puff us up and make us arrogant, like Paul talks about the people in Corinth, who are these super apostles. Our study should always make us more humble, more loving, more faithful, and more pure. Otherwise, it's just a clinging symbol. Otherwise, it's just something that will get tossed into the fire. And when we're studying and when we're teaching, that's what we want to aim on. And that even in something like this, which is really, you know, you're like, oh, there's a whole lot of information in terms of information that I don't want at the end of this day, you come out and say, okay, I can, I can be a better teacher. I want you to think, by being a better teacher, I can be a better example of Christ. And I can be a better Christian. And I can be more like Jesus. Because that's the goal of everything. And if we don't get that, then the rest doesn't matter. And that, that's, that's an opportunity we all have anytime we do teach. To say, hey, is, is everything in my life right with God? Have I got things set up the way I want to do? Have I realized that I'm not as pure or as holy or as good in my speech or conduct as I should be? And if you're not, take this opportunity to be correctable and to fix that now as we come forward and as we stand and sing the song that James is going to lead us in.